from EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C., I'm Tracy Sable with an EWTN News Link. Recovery efforts have resumed at the site of the collapsed bridge in Baltimore. Searches were suspended overnight following challenging weather conditions. Officials say the six remaining people who are unaccounted for are presumed dead. Seven people were killed following an Israeli airstrike on a paramedic center linked to a Lebanese Sunni Muslim group. A rocket attack from Lebanon then killed one person in northern Israel. Violence along the Israel-Lebanon border has kept up since the war with Hamas began. Pope Francis says that the suffering of Christ showcases his patience and love. During his weekly audience, the Holy Father told the faithful to broaden their outlook and to contemplate the crucified one in order to grow in patience. I'm Tracy Sable with EWTN News Nightly. Follow us on Facebook and X and join us this evening. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line with today's host, Father Mitch Pacwa. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Good afternoon, all of you. Welcome to Open Line here on EWTN Radio. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa. Unleashed. There's no Jack Williams to put the leash on me. I'm unmuzzled, unleashed, and we're ready to go. Um, and we would love to hear from you uh, with your calls. Just want to mention a couple things. Today is the anniversary of Mother Angelica passing away. It's been, uh, I think it's eight years now. Um, I partly remember because two weeks later I had a heart attack. Um, and, you know, it was uh, something that we certainly missed Mother a lot. Of course, she had to be uh, living up in Hansville. She wasn't able to be involved in the running of the network because uh, some years before that, in the, in the year 2001, she suffered a stroke tragically on 9-11, and that's when she took on the pirate look where she was wearing an eye patch, for those of you who remember those days. And some people, uh, you know, it actually attracted a few uh, sinners to take a look at the pirate nun. Um, Little did they know that she was out to capture their souls for Christ. And then, uh, much more tragically than that, uh, for as far as she was concerned, she had her cerebral hemorrhage on December 24th. It was Christmas Eve, and there was some. I, I was living in Dallas at the time. She had already asked me to come here to help her, and I was free to do that because of changes in my uh, assignment as a Jesuit. And my superior gave me permission to come here. And then she had this hemorrhage, and so I you know, came here full time uh, in that January. And the reason I mention that is her inability to speak, as Raymond Arroyo wonderfully calls it in his biography of her, you know, The Great Silence. Um, it began on Christmas Eve, and then her final agony before she died began on Good Friday. She went into excruciating pain as her very brittle bones just seemed to start collapsing. They were breaking inside of her. She was in agony. On Holy Saturday, she was more quiet, not unlike our Lord in the tomb. The, the pain subsided. And then on Easter Sunday, the agony for her began again. 
she was able to receive communion one last time. Father Joseph had the great privilege of offering Mass for her. I, in fact, uh, was celebrating Mass and the Easter Triduum at uh, Our Lady Lebanon Church in Dallas. I arrived back at about 5 o'clock Easter Sunday evening, and she had just died. Uh, just as just about at the time I landed, and um, we began the process of uh, grieving her in the loss and the funeral of, of Mother Angelica. Uh, truly, was a wonderful privilege. I, I've known her for forty years. Um, I had started doing programs with her back in nineteen eighty four, February twenty uh, ninth. 1984, as I've said in other broadcasts, I used to tease her that I was her Sadie Hawkins Day date. For those of you who are too young to remember Sadie Hawkins Day, in, when I was growing up, women didn't ask men to go on a date. Men always had to be the one to ask. But on, this, on February 29th, a woman could ask a guy out for a date. So I would tease her that I was her Sadie Hawkins Day date. Um, she uh, responded, as she usually did to my wisecracks, oh, you must have been pretty hard up. And I told her, well, actually, you invited me. So, <laughs> and that was something that characterized mother. For those of you who you know, see her on TV, but didn't get a chance to know her. What you saw on air was exactly what she was like off air. If you didn't like her on stage, you wouldn't like her off stage. Because for her, it was just being herself. And that was part of the brilliance of Mother. She was herself. But the greater brilliance of Mother is that she was herself, and it worked so well, not only because she was authentic, but she was authentically in love with Jesus Christ. She loved Jesus more than anything else. And that was just the way she lived, and it was exactly how she spoke on air. There was no difference. And like I say, it has been a tremendous privilege to have known her. And I'm sure she's been interceding for the network uh, so, well, the whole time that it started, uh, but in special ways during that time when she couldn't speak, you know, when she was bedridden. It's interesting how in that time, the network had its greatest growth. We went from 66,000 uh, homes, excuse me, 66 million homes, to about 300 million by the time she died. It quintupled. And all of us here thank God for her prayers. Uh, she was powerful on air. But off air, she was powerful because she kept praying to Jesus. And that was key to understanding her. So we'll remember her uh, in our prayers and masses and ask her to pray for us too. All right. Um, we've already got a few calls that are coming in. Uh, let me just give you the number. If you want to call in the United States, you can call one 833 2883986 outside north america you can call country code 12527129852752712985 205 or email us questions by writing to open line at EWTN.com or follow EWTN Radio on Instagram. 
That's especially for you young people who know how Instagram works. I haven't got a clue. All right, let's take a little break, and we'll come back and get some of you. No, we don't have time for a break? Oh, I got to do questions? Ah. See, this is why they don't usually let me be unleashed. They need a, a minder here. Um, dear Father Mitch, could you please explain the different interpretations of the phrase, give us our daily bread, presently our Father? Does it mean the Eucharist, our daily food, or is there other meaning? Um, why would you want to make it one or the other? You can make it both. It is certainly a reference to the Holy Eucharist, that is the bread of life, uh, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ itself, uh, but also it refers to our daily bread, the, the necessities of life. And I would uh, mention that in particular with this aspect. Our Lord doesn't say, give us bread for each week. Give us bread for each month. Give me the bread I'll need for my retirement. <laughs> That's not in there. We have to take it one day at a time, depending on God's providence on a daily basis. So this this is um, in a very important part of praying the Lord's Prayer. And that'll be especially true as we get to uh, tomorrow, a Holy Thursday, where we celebrate the institution of the Holy Eucharist. Now they want me off uh, to take a break. So we'll do that. Talk to you in just a couple minutes with Alan, Diane, Mary, and Jeff. Please stay with us. This is Dr. Greg Popchak from More to Life, helping you celebrate a holier life and healthier relationships. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Your favorite EWTN radio programs are all over social media. All your favorite programs are available right now. Check us out on Instagram. Just search for EWTN Radio. Remember, EWTN is everywhere. Remembering Mother Angelica. As we reflect on the 101st birthday of Mother Angelica, EWTN brings you Mother Angelica 101. When Mother Angelica was a sophomore in 1938 here at McKinley High School, she was a withdrawn student. One of the teachers saw something in her and suggested that she be a drum majorette, the first drum majorette in the history of McKinley High. She reluctantly accepted the offer, and though she thought it was one of the silliest things she'd ever done in her life, it would teach her an ease before crowds and how to be herself in public. To learn more about Mother Angelica, visit EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. All right, we are ready to start off with Jeff in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Jeff, how are things in the Commonwealth? Uh, rainy right now. <laughs> oh, okay. It's rainy today. But yeah, other than that, my question is: um, you know, Jesus would warn about the leaven of the Pharisees and all, but mm -hmm. then, then the narration, the gospel writer, and even Jesus would say about the Jews for fear of the Jews, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I just wonder why the apostles, I was wondering if it meant that we're all responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, except, of course, the Blessed Mother. And then, uh, and they would never separate, you know, for the followers of Caiaphas and follow the Sanhedrin or the Sadducees and Pharisees, but they would say the Jews, like, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was wondering if that even would lead, you know, that the scripture verses to lead to anti-Semitism, 
you know, centuries later. Sure. That, 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 that negative connotation about the Jews and, you know, and Jesus was a Jew. St. Joseph was a Jew. Our Lady is a Jew. No, but they would go to, for fear of the Jews and all of that. Right. Uh, Do you remember, Jeff, which gospel it was that especially mentioned the Jews? No, I wish I had it. Okay. Well, I do. I do. And uh, and that, this that's part of my point. I wasn't sure if you had paid attention to that. It's especially in the Gospel of St. John. Okay. Have you no, ever noticed that? No, no, I wasn't sure what, where I was. Yeah, I... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the Gospel of St. John in particular. And what was St. John's uh, ethnic and religious background? Yeah, he was a Jew. However, there is something else going on here in the Gospel of John. And one one of the dynamics, I believe, that's happening, uh, you know, first of all, they wouldn't say the in those days, uh, uh, and I would urge you to do this, read the uh, histories written by... Uh, Flavius Josephus, um, he, he was a Jewish uh, person. As a matter of fact, he was a general during the Jewish revolt against the Romans from 66 to 70. He switched sides, and he took the name Flavius from the Flavian family, uh, uh, which was the family of the two generals that the uh, conquered Jerusalem. And he wrote a couple of histories. And the reason I recommend reading uh, uh, Josephus is that he does the same thing as, as a Jew. He would talk about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Jews. Uh, you see that in his writing. This was just a normal way of speaking it had nothing to do with anti-Semitism because he too was Jewish and a member of the Pharisee party, but he was also from a priestly family. And the term Pharisee and Sadducee uh, that, that he uses very liberally, uh, he gives us the background, in fact, um, of some of the things that went on where uh, King John Hyrcanus I, you know, switched from being a Pharisee to a Sadducee. It was like, like some of the times we see politicians switch from Democrat to Republican, Republican to, to Democrat, and we just refer to the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, you know, that's just one of those shorthand expressions that you see common. And, uh, and again, I truly would urge everybody to read uh, the uh, Jewish Antiquities by Josephus and the Jewish War. Uh, those are his two key books. It gives a history of the time of Christ and before and after that is extremely helpful. So that's something that was just the way people spoke. And it had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. And, in fact, you'll see, uh, if you look at that same Gospel of John, that he says in John chapter 4 that salvation is from the Jews. Now, the issue of anti-Semitism comes in a very complicated history that develops well after the time of the evangelists. And it includes uh, t you know, tensions where Jews sometimes persecuted Christians, as in 36, but also as late as the early 600s uh, uh, A.D., uh, when they had a chance. But also Jews were persecuted first by the Romans and other people like the uh, civilian citizens of Alexandria had a terrible persecution of the Jews there, which was one of the largest Jewish communities. And there were others uh, as well. But then still later in Europe, 
uh, the Jewish community experienced a wide variety of persecutions. Um, for I, I again, it's a complicated history. Uh, the the reasons I I don't justify any of the reasons. I don't. Uh, the, these this is not correct. Uh, and in general, the popes and the hierarchy were in general, uh, you know, trying to be protective of Jews. Um, you know, they, they, they started the Jewish ghetto in Rome to have a wall there so Jews could protect themselves from any attacks. But there were these, um, you know, folks who uh, tried to have the Jews killed because they kept themselves as a religious community separate from the Christians, which they had to do in order to live out their Judaism. They always have had to have a certain separatism about them because of their dietary codes, their moral code, and uh, a variety of other issues. And instead of just letting them be, you know, Christians persecuted them. That was wrong. It was just plain wrong. And it almost always got caught up with a combination of uh, superstitions, false reports uh, of Jews, you know, trying to kill Christians and things like that. Um, These were terrible things that were said. And we were living at a time when anti-Semitism has arisen even uh, uh, worse among secular governments like the Third Reich. The National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazis, persecuted the Jews on the basis of what they called scientific racism. They believed that racism was scientific. So that was uh, a a totally different and non-Christian, non-religious motivation. Uh, Certainly that was true of the communists as well. They had another ideology than Christianity. Um, But there's a a consistent persecution of the Jews that we have to stand against. And we once again, as we see our own left uh, in in our country, the political left, taking up another, uh, you know, threat of anti-Semitism, this is wrong. And you don't have to agree with every policy of the state of Israel. You know, you can criticize the, the, the state of Israel just like you criticize the United States or any other government. But to allow that to go to anti-Semitism is, is something wrong. And that's also in the, the, today's form. It tends to be uh, not especially religious. So uh, that's why I say it's a complicated reason. But to... to base it in something in the Gospels, I think that's misread, That's reading the Gospels not in the light of how things were written in its own day, but, but how we, people have used the, those texts at later centuries. And that's, that's not how you judge a text. Does that make sense, Jeff? Well, well, I just uh, but more. I just wanted to know why Saint John, like as when they would say the Jews, if I would say the Catholics, if I'm mad at the Catholics in New Jersey, I, they would just know I meant the Catholics. Of New here's Jersey. here's the thing that I suspect, uh, and this is uh, this is a, a discussion among scholars. John was from Galilee, correct? And so, so, and Jesus too. Jesus lived up in Galilee, and the other apostles were all Galileans. And I look at those texts in John, and it says Eudaioi, you know, and indicating that they were having trouble with the Judeans. The Jewish people of Galilee had been pagan, but King John, first uh, a little bit of uh, King Simon, but then also King uh, King John Hyrcanus and Alex, King Alexander Janaeus, who were the kings in Jerusalem, the kings of the Jews, in the you know descendants of the Maccabees, had forced the pagans living in Galilee to convert to Judaism. 
And there was that's one of the reasons why you say, you know, you see in the, the gospel about Peter's denials. You are you're a Galilean, aren't you? And and the uh, and then also in the Gospel of John, they say, you know, what good can come from Nazareth? You know, he's a Galilean, not a not a Judean. And I think that part of that was the regional difference and somewhat religious and ethnic difference between the Galilean people who had been forced to convert by the kings in the second century and the early first century BC versus the people in Judea whose pedigree goes back uh, uh, directly with uh, uh, ethnic purity. And that's, I think, also part of the tension. Uh, Take a look at the nasty way some of the Judeans speak against the Galileans, especially in John 7 and 8. So I think that may be part of that. Okay? When you two are a Galilean, you can tell by your accent. Right, right. It's, uh, you know, and even when you're in Palestine among Arabs, the differences in accent from one part of Palestine to another, the way Bedouins speak versus Jerusalemites, this is, these are differences. Or the people from Hebron, there I can tell Hebron accent when I hear it. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the kind of difference too. All right, we'll be back in a little bit. That's an important question, Jeff. I'm glad you brought it up. Proclaiming the faith, changing lives. The year was 1996. The World Over debuts with Raymond Arroyo. Each week, Raymond challenges viewers with important political and cultural reporting and analysis of a wide variety of topics of interest to Catholics and people of faith. To learn more about Mother Angelica's life and the history of EWTN, visit EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica. Listen to EWTN Radio day or night. Audio On Demand brings you your favorite EWTN programs instantly to you for free. Download the EWTN app today at EWTNapps.com. Hi, we're Greg and Jennifer Willits, founders of RosaryArmy.com. Whether it's Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter, or ordinary time, an excellent way to deepen your spiritual life is through the Rosary. Whatever the season, praying the Rosary is a powerful way to meditate on the life of Jesus and Mary and to grow closer to them. The Rosary helps us to contemplate the mysteries of our salvation and unites us to the life of Jesus and Mary. Of all the tools in your spiritual toolbox, the Rosary is one of the best for building a solid spiritual foundation. Join us at rosaryarmy.com to learn more about the benefits of praying the rosary every day and how you can make it a part of your daily spiritual practice. Remember, the rosary is not just a prayer. It's a path to deeper spiritual understanding and closer union with Jesus and Mary. Find out more at rosaryarmy.com. And you can listen to our shows, Adventures in Imperfect Living, and more at rosaryarmy.com and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Hi, this is Dr. David Anders. Do you have questions about the Catholic faith? Get the answers on Call to Communion tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. All right, let us now go over to, uh, over to Allen in Belleville, Kansas. Alan, what can we do for you? Hi, Father. Uh, I was wondering, why did Jesus die at 3 p.m. on Friday? Oh, oh, oh. Um, it was very simple. You know, A, yeah. that was when he was exhausted. You know, all the Gospels agree that he died at 3 p.m. And, um, you know, he was exhausted. Now, there is another event taking place at that time and that, that namely that 
the last of the Passover lambs would have been slaughtered by 3 p.m. They would start slaughtering Passover lambs. And, you know, this is no small uh, feat on Passover. They, uh, Josephus, the, whom I mentioned before, in his Antiquities, mentions that they would slaughter 200,000 lambs. That's an enormous number of lambs, you know, to, to be brought in. And there would actually be, uh, you know, a, a, a thousand or more priests at the temple. And all they would do is uh, kill the lamb. That's all they had to do. The, for the rest of it, the skinning and cleaning of it, the uh, people who brought it in would, would do that on their own and then go home and prepare to cook it. But they had to finish the slaughtering by 3 o'clock and, uh, so that uh, you could have it started cooking before sundown because sundown was a, uh, a very solemn Sabbath and you cannot start a fire after sundown on the Sabbath or on, on the Feast of Passover, for that matter, any, even if it's not on the Sabbath. So uh, they, they had to get it done by 3. So it turns out, and you know, I don't know how many times you've been with people who are dying. Um, unless you do something to kill them, um, they just die when their body wears out. Uh, that's, and that seems to have been what happened. But the added significance of that is that he um, dies at the time when the last of the Passover lambs is slain. And that, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, prophetically, St. John the Baptist, who had said in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That Jesus, the Lamb of God, dies at the same time. And then precisely at 3 o'clock, we see that um, the uh, temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. And the significance you know, of the gospel saying that it was torn from top to bottom, it, first of all, the, the, the curtain of the temple was not a little piece of lace or uh, gossamer or some other or silk or something. It was about a foot thick. So to tear that kind of uh, pretty serious uh, curtain uh, and uh, is itself a, a, ser a serious task. And secondly, that it tore from the top down was an indication that God was in charge of tearing it from the top down. Humans might begin at the bottom up, but God began from the top down. So that is, uh, uh, along with the finishing up of the Passover lamb being sacrificed, the Lamb of God on the west side of the city, the other side of the city from the temple, dying at three, and then the temple uh, curtain being torn open. All of that is uh, a, a symbol that there is a transition to the new covenant that Jesus had initiated uh, at the Last Supper when he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Does that help? Yes, I just didn't know if it had any, anything to do with like Adam and Eve time of their first sin in the garden or not. Um, we, that that would be more than we know. Uh, I think there is a connection with Jesus dying on a Friday, and in Genesis, the uh, creation of man is on Friday, the the, the sixth day of the week, um, and then the se seventh day is the rest. So that, uh, the Sabbath rest. So that's something that we, we do see. Um, and that would be another thing, but you no, know, three o'clock as a time has no connection with that. 
I just wondering. That. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Just that's that's why we wonder, but we have to also say, well, where's where's the connection? The other ones I can make the connections that I mentioned, but I can't make it for the time of creation of Adam and Eve. All right, let us now go over to Diane in the Republic of Texas. Diane, what can we do for you? I am wondering about how long Jesus hung on the cross. Mm -hmm. I always grew up here in three hours, 12 to 3. Mm -hmm. And then we hear in St. Mark's Passion, which was proclaimed on Palm Sunday, six Mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do a little research online, and I just a little wasn't in depth. Mm -hmm. And I I read that St. John was maybe using Roman timekeeping versus the synoptics using uh, Jewish timekeeping. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was settled on six hours, and then I heard overnight uh, during Scripture and tradition, I heard you say three hours minus the time it took the Lord to carry the cross. Yeah. uh, Well, first, um, yeah, I never said overnight that he was on the cross. I was listening overnight. Oh, oh, you were listening overnight. Good. Because I said, oh, no, because there, there, um, yeah, there was one scholar who said something like that. Um, now, it, yeah, in terms of the third hour when they crucified him, that's mentioned in Mark 15, uh, verse uh, 25. And in John... Uh, 19 verse uh, John 19 verse uh, 14 um, you know we see that it, it it's at uh, noon and I don't know I'm trying to uh, get hold on a second um, John 19 verse 14. Uh, and uh, let's see, and I'm trying to see if there's any other variation. Now, see, Mark does recognize um, that it was at, you know, that the, the darkness was from noon to three. Everybody agrees that it was uh, noon to, to three, and I'm looking at uh, Matthew 27, verse 45, uh, also that there was darkness uh, from noon till 3, but I don't know that Matthew has uh, a crucifixion at 9. That's only in Mark's gospel, and I frankly don't know... uh, any specific thing about a different way of counting the hours. I just don't know of that. Uh, all of them agree on the, the, the again, the, the darkness from for three hours. Um, and Mark mentions crucifixion at uh, early morning. Um, and reconciling that is just something I have not quite worked on. I can go and check, not on the internet, but in some of the uh, commentaries, see if they have some insight. I'll try to look into that, okay? That's about as best as I can do right now, okay? All right. Um, And again, our phone number, there are a couple open lines free, as we had a couple folks on there. You can call uh, 833-288-3986. 833-288-3986, or outside North America, it's a country code 1-205-271-2985, 205-271-2985. But we still have a few more people here online. Let's now go to Mary, who's living somewhere in Southern California. So what can we do for you? Uh, thank you. Yes, I have a friend um, who is a total non-believer, mm-hmm. and I was wondering, beyond historical, anthropological 
and testimonial um, information. Mm-hmm. Is there an area like a, a deeper reason that would resonate the truth? Well, um, f- well, here's here would be my question about your friend. What is your friend's primary objection to believe? Is it is it be- not believing in God? Is it not believing in Christianity and Jesus Christ? What is the nature of their unbelief? Uh, not believing in the historicity or accuracy of, of the of Christ. Of Christ. Okay, so this person believes in God? Um, maybe in a deistic way. Okay, but th- there's a belief in uh, uh, God in some, you know, perhaps not precise way that would be uh, understood as Christian, but certainly not a belief in Jesus Christ. And what is there about the Gospels that seems ahistorical to her or him? Um, he thinks it's all kind of a narrative that's constructed, that's put together with mm-hmm. some historical episodes put together to construct a narrative um, as happens with other types of ideologies and religions, just type of a narrative mm-hmm. that people follow blindly and that it, there is too far back in the past to have any accurate, really, uh, certainty. Okay, and now... that sort of argument. Okay. Yep. couple things, then. Does your friend believe in the Punic Wars? Uh, probably, if they look it up in a textbook. Mm-hmm. And the Punic Wars were described by a number of historians... Uh, like Polybius, who claims to have been an eyewitness to the Third Punic War, but he relates to us the First and Second Punic Wars as well. Now, uh, and then Appian does as well, uh, and gives us a lot of other information. Now, why would he believe in the Punic Wars rather than in the Gospels. These were written, uh, uh, you know, quite a number of years earlier than the Gospels. Do you, do you see the, the, the difficulty? That if you start to say, well, these were written a long time ago, I can't trust them, then you, well, then you probably wouldn't believe in... Um, Many other things, uh, uh, Athens' war with Sparta, for instance, or uh, and all kinds of other things written, all of which were written, you know, sometimes not only a couple thousand years ago, but sometimes even three thousand years ago or more. So, how is that an argument? It's not a very solid one, is it? No, it isn't. Not at all. And secondly, here's something else. Polybius wrote his history of the Carthaginian War, the Punic Wars, uh, after himself having been taken as a slave and forced to be, you know, as a Greek, he was an educated man, so he didn't do field work. He was a slave in the house uh, acting as a, a pedagogue, and he sidled up close to his owner who brought him to Carthage to write down the account. How do we know that this guy, who eventually then was set free from slavery, was not just cozying up to the Romans? to write down what the Romans did to make them look good so that he could get his freedom. That would be just as possible. And then here's something else. The, uh, a key element of the Gospels is that the apostles write down stories of their own failures— they do not make themselves look good. 
Julius Caesar, in his conquest of Gaul, made himself look very good because he, while he's killing a million people by his count, if he's telling the truth. Uh, whereas the apostles show themselves to have misunderstood Jesus repeatedly, don't they? They show themselves as having one of them betrayed Jesus. Their leader, you know, the, uh, of the apostles, Peter, denying three times that he knows Jesus, and the other ten simply running away. Only one of them, John, st- stayed with Jesus to the end, but he had run away first. And then when they see Jesus Christ raised from the dead, they don't believe it's he. And they write about that in the Gospels. They think it's a ghost. They, uh, they, they, do any, they just don't believe it is he until he proves to them that it is he. And then they believe. And, then, and here's the piece de resistance that Julius Caesar didn't get killed because he wrote a book about his conquest of Gaul, but because he's trying to take power. Polybius lived a very comfortable life after he had written his story of the Punic Wars. And so on with these other guys, whereas the apostles refused to change their story even when it meant martyrdom. They were put to death. They were often tortured first, like St. Bartholomew being skinned alive. He would prefer to be skinned alive and then killed rather than change the story of the gospel. Thomas in India was stabbed with a spear. Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified in the shape of an X in Greece. Greece. And what's amazing is that they tell the same story about Jesus in places as diverse as from India up to what's now northern Iraq or southern, probably southern Turkey with Nisibis for St. Bartholomew, over to Spain, to Rome, and to Alexandria, Egypt. I mean, they are sent all over the world. They tell the same story, and they prefer to die rather than change it. Does that sound like somebody who is manufacturing a story? No, it it sounds like it's authentic, of course. I mean, if... It it would, you really, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when you study the history of the Book of Mormon, all, they list the 12 witnesses to the Book of Mormon in the opening page. All 12 of them, at different points of their life, sometimes multiple times, denied ever seeing the golden tablets. Every one of those 12 witnesses denied it. And you can take a look at books like The Changing World of Mormonism and other books recording all that, whereas the apostles preferred execution rather than change their story. That's not the way of liars. I would have your friend uh, take a look at, at the, there's a book that may help him. It's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. I forget the author now, but that may be a useful book to take a look at. Does that sound all right? Yes. What is the the first earliest version of the gospel that one could look at, the very, very, uh, what is oh. the name of the earliest version? Well, we've got, we've just got the four gospels, you know, the uh, Mark, probably written in the 50s. Luke is written by 62. Uh, I don't know how old you are, you don't have to tell me, but I'm old enough to still remember exactly where I was when John Kennedy was shot back in 1963. And I can tell you where I was during 9-11. The gap 
from the death of John uh, Kennedy to today is a lot shorter than the gap from the events to the writing of the Gospels of Mark and uh, Luke. So um, those would be the earliest ones. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's now go to Hazel, who is in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Hi, Father. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What can we um, do? I, um, I and both me and my husband grew up Catholic. Um, my husband's family, his, his dad had converted to Catholicism. Mm-hmm. So he has relatives um, that are close relatives that are not Catholic. Anyway, mm-hmm. his sister was, you know, grew up Catholic, um, but then she became, I don't know, I think it was Episcopalian. Okay. And um, my husband and I were godparents to her son, her only son, and they had the baptism in an Episcopalian church. Was that wrong for us to be his godparents? Well, probably. Uh, I think, no, we, first of all, we, we ourselves, Catholics, allow one godparent to be a non Catholic. Uh, one has to be Catholic. But one can be a non-Catholic, um, uh, so long as they promise to train the kid in the Catholic faith. Um, what you can do as the godparent of an Episcopal child is help them to focus on Jesus Christ. There are a lot of difficulties in the Episcopal Church, and that's why they're disappearing. They're they're they're, uh, they're about four. There are over four times as many Jewish people in New York City as Episcopalians in the whole country. This is this is a problem. I want them to come to Jesus and know him. And so what you can do as a godparent is give that child a number of uh, C.S. Lewis books, who was an Episcopalian, or well, he was Anglican, um, that would be consistent with their conscience and would also help them to know more about Jesus, including his novels for children as well as his apologetic books as they get older. And you can give them Bible stories and you can give them beautiful music about Christ and other things to help them uh, you know, form their conscience about Christ and learn about the gospel and, rather than you know, some of the theories that are being used uh, by people in the, in their denomination, that would be the thing that I would do. Does that help? It does. He's an adult now, though. Oh, well, then give him the C.S. Lewis uh, books. Though I started reading the Chronicles of Narnia when I was an adult, and I loved it. But you can still give him C.S. Lewis's other books. Uh, in fact, I used to teach uh, at high school. I'd give them uh, the Chronicles of Narnia to read and then have them read uh, uh, Mere Christianity. And they would say to me, you know, that sounds just like that novel you told us to read. It said, take a look at the author. Oh, it's the same guy. <laughs> so that's something that I would do there. All right, let me go to Laura in the Republic of Texas. She's in the city of Fort Worth. What can we do for you, Laura? Hi, Father Mitch. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I was having a conversation with an evangelical friend of mine and she had we were talking about the Eucharist and um, she says well what's the difference between having the Holy Spirit and uh, receiving the Eucharist it's like okay it, Lord there'd be a couple things you need to find out. Uh, because some so-called evangelicals are actually um, uh, Jesus-only churches. They believe that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. But if you help your friend go to the gospel, in John 6, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have eternal life. But in John 7, he adds, come to me and I will give you uh, the Holy Spirit from inside my heart. That's uh, He says to do both, therefore we do both. All right, I am out of time. Lord bless you this Easter season and Triduum, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. How often should I forgive my brother? 